Okay, great. Um, so we are recording now. Um, welcome everybody to today's webinar, which is The Psychology of Design with Joe Leach, who's kindly put his lovely face up there uh, for you all to see. Um, so we'll let you all know, I am Jenny from Kate Measures Consulting. I'm the Audience Insight and Research Officer who works with Kate. Um, some of you have had the pleasure of my voice before on webinars, and I'll have worked with some of you before. Um, we're very excited about this. It's the penultimate one. We've got one more on Monday, I believe. Um, so please make the most of them. Do use the chat box down in the bottom left. Um, make sure that you ask any questions, if you've got any comments that you want to put on, personal experiences, things you want to share. It's always what makes the webinars really great. Um, so today we've got Joe Leach with us. Um, I'll let Joe introduce himself um, in a moment, but just a reminder as well that, um, that this is, as I said, the penultimate uh, webinar in the Refresh series, um, and you can see all the funders there at the bottom. Um, so over to you, Joe. Thank you very much, Jenny. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks very much for your time today. Okay, a little bit about me. So um, if you guys have ever bought a train ticket online, if you've ever booked a hotel room online, ever bought anything like a washing machine or even this auction site online, chances are you've, you've been through something that I've designed. So I've, I've been working in the field of, of digital design for about 10 years. Um, and my background before that was, um, was in psychology and neuroscience. And so throughout the 10 years that I've been working, I've been using my, um, my experience in psychology to kind of make my designs better and make them more engaging. One of the scary things I've designed is that an awful lot of money goes through it, um, which I guess is a measure of success because if I got that wrong, um, I'd certainly know about it. Um, and so what that often has meant in terms of my design is that if I make a mistake or um, a button is in the wrong place or something in the user flow is completely wrong um, in terms of my digital design, then somebody pretty much um, gets into trouble because it's probably causing them a lot of money cost him a lot of money. I also do a lot of work, uh, not only in the commercial sector, but also in the public sector as well. So I've done um, lots of work for people like Bristol City Council, a few of the universities like UE in the West of England, um, and a number of others. So the stuff that I'll be talking today, although it's kind of from the commercial world, is pretty applicable to you um, guys in the public sector, third sector, or in the museum sector as well. Okay, and I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Psychology for Designers. Um, which I encourage you to buy. It's only £2.75. Um, you can buy it from psychologyforzines.com. But it's a nice um, uh, addition to the little webinar we'll be talking about now. And it's kind of, it'll give you an, uh, a, a really, it's a really good guide about how to go and find psychology for particular design problems that you have. Okay, so let's talk a bit about this. So this is the human brain. Um, and what we're talking about today is how we can basically work with the different parts of the human brain, so the bits at the top, the bottom. We'll talk through how the different bits of the brain relate to design and how we can kind of tap into those different bits of design. Okay, one of the little exercises that I like to do um, is, is this exercise. In your head, I mean, don't, you don't have to draw it now, but if you've got a bit of paper there, I'd like you to quickly sketch out a, a cup. Um, you know, draw a cup, the first thing that comes into your mind when you're drawing a cup. Have a little think about it, picture a cup in your mind or quickly sketch something out. Now, what might have gone through your mind is a number of things about a cup. You know, you might have seen a cup like this one, which is, you know, a cup of tea cup. You might have seen a cup like this one, which is like a water cup. But whatever happened, you, you, we could all kind of agree that this is a cup. This is a cup um, and other things as well. And um, what's interesting about this is there was a, a, a piece of research done a few years ago by a gentleman called Labov. Um, and he asked people from around the world and even in different in the same countries to draw a cup. And here's the number of different cups that he got back. You can kind of see here. So um, in the end, he classified about 15 different styles of, of cup with handle alone. There were cups without that stuff. Um, uh, but what was ever happening? And the, the big thing that he spotted and he understood was that people draw and think about cups differently. Yet yeah, we all recognize these pictures as being cups. We all have a slightly different view in our heads about what we drew. So you guys might have drawn a curved side, something long, something flat, something French like this bowl here. But whatever happens, we, we slightly differ in, our, um, in, our, in the way that we 
view objects in the world. We all know that each of these is a cup, and when we use the word cup, we can envisage it, but each of us have a subtly, slightly different view as to what's going on. And this can, you know, causes some real problems when it comes to design, because effectively what that means is we base our own design decisions based on perceptions of the world. And there's nothing wrong with that, and some great designers come out of our perceptions of the world. But one of the most important things we can humbly do as designers or people who work in digital is to realize that we do see the world ever so slightly different from everybody else that's there. And this is great if things go well, um, you know, because again, designing a cup is pretty good. It's pretty hard to mess up designing a cup, and there's quite a few people out there who've done it. But when it comes to designing a quite a complicated digital product, our perceptions and our views about how certain things should work can cause us real problems. I've seen this, this has happened to me. Um, this is a story about the last time that I visited this city. You probably know it, this is, um, this is Buenos Aires in Argentina. I've been to this twice in my life and um, both times uh, the same thing happened to me. Um, this machine, and this very machine, ATM card, and it happened to be twice. It happened to be both times in Argentina. And it was like, well, I remember thinking, why has this happened? Why has this happened twice in Argentina to me? Um, this is the, uh, the the first photograph I took of the machine. It happened to be first time when I went out. So I could you know, give it to the insurance company or the bank to get my card back. I went back the second time. This was about a year and a half ago. Um, I took a photo of the bank the same way. And it turns out, I'm pretty sure it was the same cash machine that ate my card both times. Um, so what was happening? Why did this cash machine and why do cash machines in Argentina disagree with me so differently in so, way, in so many different ways? Um, this is a photo of, um, uh, of my local um, cash machine. This is in that West cash machine. This is a cash machine um, I've used in the UK. Um, and what that means from the way I do things is this is um, I build up a model in my head or I'm so used to using cash machines in the UK. That I build up a model in my head of how cash machines should work anywhere in the world. So anytime I come across a new cash machine in a new country, I take the model of the UK cash machine and I apply it to um, the Argentinian uh, cash machine. So here's the model that we go through when we're buying, you know, getting cash out of a cash machine in the UK. We all know this if you're from the UK, you enter your card, you enter your PIN, you select the amount. You, you get your cash at the end of it. So when I went to Argentina, I followed these steps. And the most important step, obviously, when people are in, is they, the goal they have is this big thing here. Is they want to get cash out of the cash machine. So once this, I've got the cash out of the cash machine, my job is done. So what happened in Argentina? Why did the machine mess it up? Well, here's what happens in the Argentinian cash machine. If we've got the steps at the top. So you enter your card as per normal, you enter your PIN, everybody you know, understands that, it matches the UK model but beneath it. You select the amount of money you want, but then in Argentina what happens is it gives you the cash. Great, fantastic. You get your cash, what do you normally do when you get your cash in the UK? You take your money and you leave the bank, which is exactly what I did. The problem being that in Argentina, they don't give you your card back until after you've given your cash. So I took my cash out, put it in my wallet, left the bank, thank you very much. Machine beeps at me, beep, 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 beep. Out comes my card. I don't have to pick the card up anymore because I've achieved what we call, in this, in this world, goal state, which is getting the cash. I've achieved goal state, but actually, in reality, I've missed a step because I haven't removed my card. Now, this is the reason why well-designed cash machines in the UK work like this, is they give you your card before you get your cash, because they understand that this is a problem. You go to a cash machine with this idea in your head, give me cash. That is, once that goal was accepted and understood, job done, I leave. So that's why in the UK, we, we remove the card first. The problem is in Argentina, that's slightly different. Um, this is called, um, we build these mental models of the world around us and we apply them to new situations. This is very, very common in everything that we do. Another good example of this is, guys, you've all been to Starbucks, I, I take it. Yeah, you have. Um, you all know how to order a coffee in Starbucks. So any Starbucks you go into in the world, you know how to order um, a coffee. It's very, very straightforward, and very, very simple. You know what to do. You go into Starbucks, you order a coffee. 
any Starbucks you go into, they do it the same way. Have you ever had that experience where you've gone into a cafe, say in some or Milan or Madrid? You go into the cafe and you think, well, this is a cafe. I know how to do a cafe. I'll go to Starbucks or to everything, um, um, you know, to any other cafeterias around me. I know what I have to do. You go in, you go to the counter, and the guy behind the counter says, no, 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 sir, you need to sit down. So you sit down and somebody comes to serve you. It's a very, very different mental model of how you buy a coffee. It's the same idea. Now, have you seen many of these uh, who haven't got Starbucks in their country? They'll go into Starbucks or they'll go into a local pub in the UK. They'll sit down at the table and wait for somebody to come and serve them and feel a bit stupid when nobody does. Because again, they do the same thing. They're taking a model of a previous situation in a now, this is the same. Um, we can tap into this really quite nicely in terms of um, our digital design. So we can take this and we can use this to our advantage when we're creating designs ourselves. Um, let me through to that. So I want to talk to you a bit about a project I worked on recently um, for uh, a company called Saga, who some of you may know in the UK. Now, who Saga are? Saga offer holidays and other um, other kinds of products to people over 50. Realistically, that's mostly people over 60 and mostly into their 70s and 80s. And I did a project with Saga to help them um, redesign their cruise um, cruise ship booking engine online. So really quite a complicated thing is to be able to book a cruise ship online. By to be able to book a cruise holiday, it's quite a difficult thing. There's lots and lots of factors you have to think about. And when I, when I first um, uh, began working with, with Saga, their website wasn't performing particularly well. Stuff wasn't going right. Um, uh, stuff wasn't going right at all with them. Um, at Saga. They were doing, you know, the website was okay. It was doing a little bit of taking, you know, people coming through it, but they were seeing a huge drop off in people going through the process and a lot of people weren't being able to, able to book holidays. A lot of people were picking up the phone to try and complete their booking process. And when we went and worked with Saga, we, we spotted, this is the model that Saga had for the different steps that people go through to um, to book a holiday, you know, they move to ship. You know, they choose the ship they want to go onto. They choose the itinerary they want to take. They choose the cruise details they want to take. They choose the cabin. They choose the flight to get there. Then they enter their passenger details. This is the model that Saga came to us and said, "Hey, um, Joe, CX Partners, this is how we think people book cruise holidays." So the job that I did then is I went out and we spoke to lots of people who do indeed do this sort of thing. They go out and they buy and they book cruise holidays online. And we watched them trying to book a cruise holiday online. Um, now, I all know what you're thinking. Um, has the guy down there with dark hair, is he wearing a wig? Yes, he is. And yes, it was awkward interviewing for a whole hour when he had that. Um, he was a nice gentleman, though. Um, so what I did is we, we watched and we spoke to these people about how these people booked cruise holidays. Um, we also spent some time and we went through and we chatted and we spent a, a couple of days listening to the way people talk, phone up Saga when they're trying to book a cruise holiday phone. So they phoned up. We spent two days with the best people in the call centre, understanding what questions people had um, what um, and how, more importantly, how people and how the best call operatives dealt with those particular questions, how they spoke to um how they spoke to customers, how they dealt with those problems. So effectively, the, you know, for me, is if you can go out and speak to customers, a bit of a no brainer when you're designing digital stuff. But if you can also speak to people who deal with customers day to day, you can get an awful lot of insight how, about how customers and your museum guests interact with digital services that you are producing for them. It's a really low cost way of doing this sort of stuff, it's to go out and talk to people. Okay, so back to Saga's problem. Um, one of the things I also did as well, which was, which was a great couple of days, I went on a Saga cruise for three days with um, some over 70s and uh, it was a lot of fun. I got quite a lot of unwanted attention. Um, I was trying to be the researcher that sort of blended in, but um, it, it was a really interesting experience of spending, going and spending and immersing myself in the product that they have. Um, so again, you know, as Kate said, you know, go and spend some time with people on the museum gallery floor, watch the stuff that you've got so valuable is going out and speaking to people. So what did we discover? So we discovered these are the pieces of information that people need at each step of the existing Saga customer journey. So, you know, each step, this is the questions that people had at each step, you know. So one of the first things you had to do on the Saga site was choose the ship that you wanted to go on a cruise on, which was a bit odd. Why would I choose this ship? Where will it go? 
what will it sell to when I want to go? Which has the nicer cabins of all the ships that you offer? Which has the amenities that I need? And so at each individual step of the process, people had all of these inf pieces of information they were missing. So the thing that we did after that was we then went and mapped how people got the answer to these particulars on the website and generally in life. And the big thing that we spotted was that people were jumping around the different steps in the customer journey to get answers to particular questions, but also an awful lot of people were picking up the telephone to say, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. I've got this particular question, you know, what films are going to be showing in the cinema? Which is the cabins is best? You know, have, is there access to the lifts? Do I need, you know, all these questions that the customers had, we mapped out to Saga to kind of show them what was going on at any one point. And the big useful thing about this picture that I'm showing you here is that it showed to Saga that the current customer journey was a bit of a mess and a bit jumbled. And what this allowed us to do as a project, go to the powers that be to, you know, basically hold the purse strings and go, hey, look, here is the problem with your, your digital services right now. Loads of people can't use them and need human support to kind of get there, but also they're jumping around all through the digital services. They just really aren't being anchored and moving through from start to finish, you know, like the steps at the top here, the steps at the top that you can see at the bottom. They're not moving through those steps in the order that you want them to. They're jumping between stuff or they're picking up the telephone to, to figure out what was going on. This diagram is really useful and helpful for us to help figure out what they should do next. Um, and so what we did after that basically was give them a map of this is the this is the order that you should build your website in. Very, very simple, straightforward map of how your customers expect to use your services. You know, these are the steps they expect to go through. Pretty straightforward. And here's the information to the individual steps. So my advice to you is if you're designing a digital service, go out, speak to your customers, evaluate what services you've got now. Speak to your customers, but then just do a simple map like this of the steps that people go through when they're going to be using the digital, these digital services and what information these people might be looking for each individual step. Maybe this is the interactions they want to see, but whatever happens, a simple map like this can really, really help you when it comes to the next part of designing the website, which is you know, basically designing the digital service, the kiosk or whatever. It's very, very expensive once you engage a designer or a um, a, a technologist to build this stuff for you to change your mind to make changes post you know post development if you do something like this is you should be following the steps and building the steps up of a model to kind of help understand and help your customers follow the journey that um, you're building for them um, okay so how does this relate to psychology? Basically, as humans, we have this big bit at the top of the head you can see underneath here. There's a whole area on the top, sort of big semicircle kidney shaped thing. It's called the cerebral cortex. And it's huge, huge part of our brain. So us humans are very, very good at thinking. Finally, I hear you say, well, the biggest problem is, and this is a very nice quote from Thomas Edison. Basically, there's no expedient to which a man will not go to avoid the labor of thinking. What he's basically telling us here is people hate thinking. People are lazy. People are really, really lazy, and so they don't like to think. The best thing we can do in terms of designing is to limit the amount of thinking that people have to do because it uses, the brain uses 20% of the total energy of the human brain. If we can avoid and stop people thinking, as I said before, by plotting out each of the individual steps that the customers go through or guests go through and then using a digital by researching and asking them what they need, plotting out each individual step on a piece of paper, very, very simply before we design to limit the amount of thinking that people have to do when they're using the service, people are gonna engage with it more. Anything we have to do to stop people thinking means our services are going to be better. Okay. Well, how did that work out for Saga? Well. This is the first thing that happened to Saga in week two that the website went live. One transaction that was £43,000 for one particular cruise holiday. And that's by far the biggest transaction of anything that I've ever done in my life. 
somebody was able to buy a round the world cruise for four people, it's about £10,000 each, that they are six months. They bought that online without any help from me. And this was helped through the fact, again, because we put steps in the right order for people there. So my first tip is anything digitally designed is you match the mental model and the expectations of how your customers think that thing should work. Okay, questions, folks. Anything at this point? So I'm going to go back and have a little look. Thanks, Rick. Um, so if anybody's, um, I don't think we've had any questions so far. Okay, no problem. All right. If people are still typing, I'll give it a couple of seconds just for you guys to sink that in, for that to sink in, and we'll keep keep going. Okay. Okay. So we've talked then a bit about getting the order of in terms of design, getting the order right and putting the expectations for what people need at each step of that order for your digital product right. Um, oh, good question from Mr. O'Malley in Bath. Does everyone have the same mental model? Um, good question. Generally, mostly yes. It depends how complicated the process is. Um, the one I chose there was really complicated. So there were a number of different nuances in there. Um, but on the whole, if you do the research and you speak to enough different types of people, like maybe you've got three or four different types of user groups, like maybe they're, I don't know, kids or um, I don't know, older people or you know, people with different literacy levels or whatever, as long as you've gone out and you've spoken to the right groups of people, you can generally spot the trends. And most of the time, there'll be a consi fairly consistent, um, I should do this the other way, shouldn't I? There'll be a fairly consistent model of, um, of how people do this stuff that will we'll start in one place and finish at the other. You might be able to have different information needs throughout that for different user groups, but on the whole, most people start and finish at the same point. As long as you've done the research, you, you pretty much should Okay, so next. Um, so this is a, a, quite a famous um, paper that was published in, in the year 2000. Um, and uh, most people look at it and go, well, obviously completely um, but actually it's quite an important thing to think about here um, and what the title of this paper is is what is beautiful is usable um, and these guys also did a study on an ATM you can spot a theme emerging here um, and what these guys did and it was a study that was done in Israel is they um, did a, designed a series of screens for a cash machine or an ATM um, and they designed some that were basically just green text on the black background. Um, they designed a couple which were much more graphical, um, but basically were in essence the, the, the identical um, interaction. So the information was in the same place, the wording was exactly the same, you went through the same steps. But the way that these guys did it is they made one a bit prettier than the other one. And the big conclusion from this paper, well, what is beautiful is, is usable. Um, and what that kind of showed, and what, in fact, actually, hey, do you want to see the beautiful one that they designed? So this is a beautiful ATM design from that paper. Um, really not quite sure. I mean, the ones that were probably plain were probably huge and ugly, but this is the beautiful one that they designed. But you kind of get, you sort of see the point of going on. This compared to a boring, plain text, gray and black interface is a bit more exciting. And the thing that I guess this paper showed is people are a little bit more forgiving if the thing that you've got is pretty or prettier than the standard. And people's perceptions of it is something usable, and the effort they'll put into something that's not usable is going to be greater if it's pretty. So if it's pretty, people are more forgiving, and they will try a little bit harder to to, to go through the product with. And this is interesting, and I've kind of used this again in some of the the stuff that I've done. So another um, company that I'm lucky enough to work for is um, is Ritz Carlton Hotels, um, uh, and. The, the wonderful thing about working for Ritz Carlton is the product itself is just such a wonderful thing. Um, probably a bit beyond, certainly beyond my means, most people here's means, but the, the product itself is a premium product. It, um, and the way that Ritz Carlton um, work and the way that Ritz Carlton talk about and deal with design is they do it, do it through photography. Um, and the way that they do this stuff is they have very, very beautiful, evocative imagery. And imagery is really, really important in, in making things feel, to invoking emotions. A beautiful picture like this can make something feel nicer. 
feel better, makes you feel better at looking at it. And so what, what's happening in people's heads when they're looking at this picture is you're immediately putting yourself in the position of sitting in that nice sun, sun lounger, looking out at that wonderful sunset. I mean, I doubt many of us will ever get there, but we just like to be there. And what this means in terms of Ritz-Carlton is Ritz-Carlton are part of the, the Marriott Hotels Group. And Marriott have a number of different hotel brands from quite, you know, um, basic but still very nice motels. They have a, they've recently launched a, a brand new hotel brand with IKEA, um, which is very very basic and designed for backpackers in the in Europe. And one of the things that we spot with with each of these experiences is the is the the way that people book hotels is exactly the same for people booking a backpacking hostel to somebody spending fifteen twenty a night on a on a on a, a Ritz Carlton hotel. The process is identical, and the Marriott Group, who own these IKEA hotels, have the same booking engine for both of these brands. Yet both of these brands are very, very different in their experiences. And so, what do we see? What does Marriott see in terms of what that means for the websites? Well, more people manage to get through the booking engine on the Ritz Carlton site than people who are using the IKEA hotels. Now, what is interesting about that is one of the big things that people talk to me about when I'm doing user research, and I've done a lot of user research with loads of different age groups of people, is I've done user research with people who are what we call, you know, Generation Y or millennials who are born in the 1990s and onwards. I've done an awful lot of research with people in their 60s and 70s and 80s. And the thing always people ask me is like, oh, we make sure this website's easy, that old, you know, older people can use it too. Well, here, let me tell you something for nothing. The Ritz Carlton customer, on average, is in their 60s. The Moxie or the IKEA hotel customer, on average, is in their 20s. More of the older demographic get through the booking process on Ritz Carlton than they do on the Moxie IKEA hotels in the same way. So, what's going on there? Well, let me tell you what's going on there. And part of the research we've had a look at is that the Ritz Carlton experience is beautiful. The IKEA experience is an IKEA experience. You know, it's very, very basic. It you know does the job, but it isn't a beautiful experience. It isn't an amazing experience. So, this is a, another useful tip for you guys: is this that is this idea that beauty evokes emotion, emotional things we engage with, we want to spend more time with. So we're going to spend the effort going through, and we'll put that extra mile in if something is emotionally beautiful, engaging in a positive way. Um, other things that we do with, with Ritz Carlton as well is we do that through copy. So I hear what you guys are saying. We work for museums. We can't afford to have, go out and have a photographer take a photograph of a beautiful bee in Bali. You can do the same thing with, with words. If you can craft words to say more beautiful things, you can craft and you can make those experiences feel real. So again, one of the suggestions I've got for you guys, if you can't do beautiful photography and not everybody can, is have some words that evoke emotion. OK, these words are great. Watch the sun setting beyond the Indian Ocean from the comfort of your own rooftop balcony. This is a very emotional. Again, same story. If you can write in that emotional way in terms of the copy that you guys work with, the same thing is true. Words evoke emotion in the same way that beautiful photography evokes emotion. So you don't have to spend an awful lot of money on doing this stuff. You can just write good quality words. So this talks to another bit of the brain. So we talked about this um, bit at the top here, this kidney-shaped cortex. This, this uses a lot of energy. This is cognition. This is stuff we're aware of doing. We're aware of thinking. This bit, this next bit down, this is what we call the limbic system. This part of the brain is dealing purely with emotion. And emotion is more primitive part of the brain. It has much more of a stronger effect on the rest of everything else that's going on. This part of the brain, this emotional bit in the middle, its connections just go throughout the rest of the brain. It filters out into every other part of the brain. So if we can activate the emotional part, it activates all the other bits of the brain right up into the thinking area of the brain. So if we can evoke emotion, people don't have to think as much. Okay, back to the idea that what is beautiful is usable. Again, if we can evoke emotion, Feel good chemicals are released, thinking becomes easier, and we're happier to engage with what's going on. Okay, so tip two. 
evoke emotion in the words and the imagery that you do. Spend a little bit more time and effort finessing what you're trying to do. If your kiosk, your website, your digital app, whatever it might be, if you spend that little bit of effort on the crafting of the design and the crafting of the words, people are going to have a more delightful experience and invest a lot more time in using your app. If something's ugly, people aren't going to invest. If it's a bit more beautiful, people may well invest a bit a little bit more. Okay, any questions? Let me go and have a little, little look down at the, uh, the questions. They're down there, down there, aren't they? Okay. I'm not sure if there are any questions. Uh, so far, but if we give people a little minute, perhaps to yeah, I have a little thing. How long have I have on my on my cap? Oh, um, Admini, uh, words that make a personal connection between visitor and the subject matter that evokes emotions less impersonal. Yeah, definitely that empathy. Absolutely, it does, and it's. It's often very tempting and very easy to use boring business site language when you're designing something like an interface, like a kiosk or a mobile phone app. You use words like click and select and all these boring other words that are there as well. Within the museum sector, you're often, you know, you're trying to engage people with the, um, the exhibits or the, the apps that you're working with. And, and just being and adding emotion to the words that you use is going to get people to engage, not only with the digital stuff that's here, an exhibit but also the exhibit as well if you can engage and get very excited and emotional about what's going on that emotion is going to going to rub off on to your to your um to your customers as well to your to your guests at your museum oh there we go rick yeah good point mm -hmm. oh, i'll see rick, like that that's it yeah you, i can see what you're trying to do here Okay, does the pursuit of beautiful invite subjectivity into the process? Yes, 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 it does. Um, but we can all culturally pretty much agree on what's more beautiful than less beautiful. It doesn't have to be, you know, one's green and one's blue, or most people prefer blue to green. It doesn't necessarily have to work like that. That imagery that I just showed you of that Ritz cult, we can all agree that is a pretty beautiful picture. So on the whole, we share more in terms of what we subjectively all, all believe is beautiful rather than we, we differently believe is beautiful as well. So on the whole, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, there are certain circumstances when, yes, some people think find things more beautiful than other things, but on the whole, as a species, we're pretty good at agreeing on that as well. Oh, okay, good question from Mr. O'Malley down here. Music can be beautiful and evoke emotions. What thoughts do you have on using music or websites on apps? I, I completely agree. Music can definitely, definitely improve, um, improve mood. And I think in talking about, um, so a lot of our guests here are from museums. And so you can kind of use that in a physical space, music. The, um, and music can be really, really useful if it's a personal interaction you're having with a particular thing. So actually apps on phones are pretty good for music because it is much more of a personal experience. Um, it's walking in a fine line. We all remember those websites from the kind of, you know, the early 2000s, and late 1990s, when you sort of started on, you joined the website, there'd be like a musical track playing in the background. And I think that was if you're at work or how immediately we all switched to switch the music off. So I think you can do music well, but it, it, it definitely has its place. And it's a really challenging thing to get right. And it's one of those things where if you're thinking about including music in your app or your or something else as well is, is do some research on how appropriate it is to do it as well what's the atmosphere that people are in if it's on the museum floor are people going to be able to hear the music are they going to be able to, to listen to it is it essential for the experience is this going to be on a website is it appropriate is it on an app is this going to be appropriate as well so you know by all means implement it but do some testing and try and see if it's going to be appropriate for doing it because it can either go really well or really really badly with music it's kind of hard to get that in between ground as well but yeah very good point yeah, I guess so. I guess music in a physical experience um, can be very distracting. Exactly right. Yeah, it's quite hard. Um, it's quite hard to get right. And then, you know, you find people doing things like playing music in the background, sort of this sort of bland musical background to stuff. And that actually can be more challenging people who are hard of hearing because it just adds a level of noise into the experience that's going on as well. So I, I don't always know if it can be good or bad. Um, the one I will say, which is really effective, if you can get it right, is, um, is smell. Um, Smell has much more of a dramatic emotional engagement than anything else. So if we go back to this bit of the brain down here, guys, can you see my mouse pointer when I'm pointing on the screen? I don't know if you can. Can I point at the page? Do you know if I can do that? Sorry, Jenny. Uh, no, I don't think it does bring up your mouse. 
Okay. All right, no worries. Well, just the bottom right hand corner of the emotional white box is a little area of the brain. Um, in fact, sorry, left hand bottom of the emotional box down here, um, bottom left hand, so I always get my left and right confused, is a little area of the brain called the um, uh, olfactory bulb. And what the olfactory bulb does is control smell, or it's the, the brain smell center. So, you know, it's very, very close. If you look at the bottom white right hand corner of that emotion box, that's where it lives. You can see it's very, very close to the, to the nose. Um, and what that bit of the brain does, that controls smell. So everything that olfactory goes into the olfactory um, bulb and controls it. And what you can spot from the brain is that the smell center is so close to the emotional center. And there's a, there's a physical reason for that. There's a, um, a reason behind that. And the reason behind that is that um, smell is very, very emotionally engaging. And it needs to be. So, for example, if um, we smell something really, really terrible, that's generally a warning to us that something's wrong. Normally it's like food that's gone off or, you know, something that's really bad. You know, that smell, that invokes negative emotion. But also the truth, the same is true with positive emotions. So positive smells can have an incredibly a strong emotional engagement. So if you have a, a smell, you can create emotion from smell. Yes. Kate, good, I'm sorry, Jenny, good, good point again. Is the, uh, is the, is the smells from the Jorvik Viking Museum. I remember those from when I was a kid. Simple. Um, yeah. You know, we've all got that, those impressions of you smell coffee, it takes you somewhere. You've got that, we've all got that, you know, you smell something you haven't smelled for years and suddenly it takes you back to an incredible moment in your life, a very emotionally engaging moment in your life, you know. Um, estate agents use this, they, you know, they tell you to, to brew, make coffee before you're selling your house or make bread. It has an emotional engagement to you. Smell is so close to um, the part of your brain that controls emotions. So if you can get smell into your experiences, then great, fantastic. Um, by all means, do it. You can really, really evoke emotion. Also, as part of that, it's very easy to get that wrong. You can overly um, lay on the smell. And certainly artificial smells can just, after all, get a bit too much, which is a bit of a shame. But on the whole, um, uh, smell is a great way of doing this. Um, so yeah, I'm just looking, reading Amy's, Amy Adams' um, uh, quote down here, the Time and Tide Museum in Norfolk does a smell thing really well. It's housed an old smoker and still smells of smoked fish. We can all smell it now and it's all evo evoking that emotion of being there as well. So yeah, great if you can use smell at the same time to evoke emotion. Okay, so the last bit of the brain then. So we've talked about these two other areas of the brain. Um, we've talked about thinking up here and how people hate to think. We've talked about emotion and how impactful it can be. But the last one I want to talk to you about is this, is this mm, less understood area of, um, uh, uh, of instinct. Um, and what's interesting about the instinctual part of the brain is we're often not aware of what's going on. We're less aware of it. Thinking we're fully aware of. Emotion we're less aware of. Instinctual stuff we're really not aware of. And the instinctual stuff really operates at a very, very, very um, base level. So the instinctual brain um, uh, is focused on a couple of things. It's focused on eating, um, getting food in. It's also very heavily focused on um, on sex, some of the big drivers of us humans. So, you know, eating and, and really what the instinctual brain does is it keeps us alive. It's built for survival. It's built for us to survive and to, you know, pass on our genes to the next level of um, of, uh, of humans, basically. And this, this is what really drives us at a base level. Um, now, these three... Is, is comfort and safety uh, um, a part of that instinct level as well? Um, I, you guys, Mabel, have you ever heard of this thing called Maslow's Hierarchy of Need? It's like this big triangle. Um, it basically it talks about the hierarchies of the most important things. You know, bottom of the of the base is, is um, you know is, is eating, drinking, survival, and then what Maslow talks about is is the the less the drivers that are less important as you sort of move up within that hierarchy of need and sort of the instinctual stuff is really based like food and drink but then other ones like safety and comfort are a level above that so you know safety and comfort is after effectively eating and drinking because you really basically need those to survive so it's very close but not quite there safety safety is a bit more on the emotional side it's a little harder um also with Mars Mars's hierarchy of need it's great the stuff at the bottom but don't necessarily agree with the stuff at the top it's very very culturally biased and it's very very focused effectively they've done a study on Maslow's hierarchy of need but it's more focused on, on western men as being true so it's it's useful but you know 
being a proper psychologist myself, I don't 100% agree with it, but it's a useful um, tool in this respect to talk about this stuff. So anyway, back, back to instinct. So we see this instinctual stuff being used, um, and this is often used quite badly, and you have to use like quite a blunt instrument. So we see it famously in, um, uh, in this idea that within advertising, if you've ever watched Mad Men, they, they use this stuff quite well, in the idea that, that sex sells. Sex is something that is very, very, uh, operates at a very instinctual level, and that's both men and women. Um, it operates at quite an instinctual level. So you kind of see that in terms of how people have used it in terms of advertising. Um, and what was interesting about this is I went, well, let's have a look at the science behind this stuff. So I went back to a couple of papers um, to have a look at um, uh, some of this stuff and, and, and looked at this idea of, of what is going to stimulate this particular area of the brain. Um, and what was interesting is, is this part of the brain, again, you know, I'm a neuroscientist at heart. I, I talk about different bits that are related to each other. Is this area at the back of the brain here, this is what's called the fusiform gyrus. And the fusiform gyrus um, has one function and one function alone. Um, believe it or not, the bit at the back of our head controls um, uh, vision. So the fusiform gyrus is very much part of vision. And what the fusiform gyrus is, allows us to do is to recognize faces. And specifically within that, um, emotion within faces. Um, but facial stuff is, has such a strong link with how we are looking towards in terms of survival. And the instinctual layer of our brain is also the bit of the brain I talked about sex and talked about food. But the third thing this part of the brain does is also to um, look at um, it's what we call the flight or fight um, approach, which is when you're in danger, you know, you get that feeling of adrenaline this instinctual part of the brain triggers that. And the area of the fusiform gyrus is close in proximity to that part of the brain. It's also close in proximity to emotional part of the brain as well. Um, but what that means is faces are very, very good at engaging this instinctual layer of the brain. Um, and what that means is one of the things that I spend a lot of my time with the research that I do is I have this very impressive, expensive piece of equip equipment called um, an eye tracker. And what the eye tracker does is it allows us to have a look at um, what people, when we do user research, what people are looking at on the screen at any one point. So the red areas show areas where people spend a lot of time looking and the other areas you know, kind of show that. But what this tool allows us to do is to understand what people are looking at on the screen at any one time. And so what I've seen from the research that I've done is this, is this thing. People spend more time and higher probability of looking at faces on your websites. So this is a useful little thing for engaging with people on the digital stuff that you do is put faces of people up there. Okay, if you can put faces up there, you can basically effectively hit the instinctual part of the brain. The two are connected. If you put attractive faces up there, guess what? People are more engaged with pretty people. Sorry to break it to you guys. However, Have you guys seen, well, in fact, you, you must have seen this, um, the, the, those sort of very, very bland websites often put up by, um, um, you know, there's the, the stuff that's kind of all over the internet, really, really bland. And they have lots of what we call stock imagery. So stock imagery is imagery that you buy very, very cheaply. And it kind of does things like, you know, it's like a, a bunch of people in a meeting room or it's a, you know, woman with a laptop screen open or whatever. But there's one thing that's very, very consistent about stock imagery, and that is everybody is very, very beautiful and they have perfect teeth. Um, and so what happened in the early days of the internet um, was this stock imagery of, of beautiful people worked very, very well. So, you know, you wanted a, a picture of, a, uh, uh, of something on your website. If you put a picture of a beautiful person on that website, that website was more successful. People spent more time looking at it. They, you know, they, you know, they, there was a, a, a flow. People, people wanted to buy more things. People bought more things back in the old days. Um, what's happened now, however, is that us humans have kind of got, um, we've got used to that happening. Um, and one of the, 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 the clever things about our brain is we are very, very good at filtering out stuff um, if we see it everywhere. So if we know it's not relevant anymore, we filter it out. So what that means in terms of, I'm gonna jump back a couple of slides to this slide here. What that means for us and what that means for neuroscience and what that means for design is, if you put a picture of a pretty person on your, on your site, um, 
yeah, the fusiform gyrus does mean that you glance down on that and have a look at that the first time you engage there. If it is a, um, a stock image, then what happens is this thinking bit of the brain at the top takes over and says, do you know what? We've seen a million of those things. That means nothing. And people disengage with that photo and that photo has no effect anymore. It has the, an effect for the first microsecond of what's going on in that interaction. But suddenly your thinking brain takes over and goes, do you know what? Ah, no. Because again, the instinctual bit of the brain is super quick because it keeps you alive. The thinking part of the brain is slow because it takes more energy and you know you don't want to you don't have to use it all the time so what's happening when you put a stock image of somebody on the screen is is you're getting an immediate response from the, the person that's there but the thinking brain takes over and basically ignores it so guys we can't get away with just putting a stock boring picture of an attractive person on the screen now but what we can do is we can put pictures of people on the screen but what we want to be putting pictures pictures on the screen are our regular people like you and me um, most people are pretty attractive. So putting pictures of your team on the website is gonna help people engage with you. People are gonna look at that picture immediately because like I said, instinctually, the first thing we look at when we look at the screen is we look at people. We then make that assertion in our head with the thinking part takes over and we go, oh, is that stock photo? Yes, no, no. Often we'll spend a bit more time looking at it and go, hey, do you know what? That person seems really nice. I like them. And it engages the emotional part of our brain. So honest, real pictures of real people could have an engaging, emotional, instinctual effect on how people view and look at your team. So we all know this stuff. People do always empathize with other people. But this is why. This is why people emphasize, empathize with other people. They'll empathize with people who are behind a particular product or service. So on, you know, on your museum website, if you have the people behind the museum on the site, people are going to more engage with it more. You all know this, guys, from when you, you build museum exhibits, telling stories of real people really brings these exhibits to life. Do the same thing on your website. Put pictures of the team up there. Tell the stories with pictures of faces up there. Faces are going to engage people and then the stories behind them are going to kind of keep that there as well. So yeah, Jenny's question, are we better to use honest images from our museums? Yes, please. Real visitors, real anything. As long as you've got people up there, Great, don't use that crappy stock of photography that everybody else is using. Okay, let me jump towards. So, tip three then, for the perfect design, if you do these three things properly, designs of the digital stuff that you guys do is going to be more effective. Okay, so number one, um, match the mental model of how your visitors or users expect your site or your digital service to be. Go out, Spend a bit of time talking to them, watching them using the services that are there. Spend time on the, the call center if you've got a call center. Go and speak to the people that um, work on the museum floor or deal with your customer services. Really try and get inside the heads of the visitors and the people that are there. Number one, to match the way that those people expect your digital stuff to work. And if you follow and match those services together and match that mental model, people will think less and they'll spend more time engaging with the digital stuff that you do. All right, number two, evoke emotion, okay? So go out, use beautiful pictures, use beautiful words, invoke smell, use music, whatever it takes, but get people really emotionally engaged with what you do. And again, people will be more forgiving if stuff goes wrong and they'll spend more time engaging with you. Um, and finally, be a bit more human. So have pictures of real people, be honest about who they are, tell the stories, because again, like I said, instinctually your people are gonna be drawn to people, instinctually, They'll be that's what will happen. Get them there, use that to get people through the door, then invoke emotion, tell stories, do that stuff, but whatever it is, be real and be human when you do this stuff. Okay, that's my third three piece of advice. Okay, some questions. So Rob, Rob, Rob Simmons writes from Fishbourne. Um, do people prefer to look at faces that look like themselves, i.e. young, older, male, female? Uh, yes, sadly, this is true. Um, uh, that can get you into real problems if you start to, 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 to deal with that. Um, if you start to go down that route of saying, well, let's make sure we get pictures of people who look like the people who are in our museum, you just start to get into really difficult areas culturally. Um, I, I've spoken to businesses that have tried to do this stuff 
you know, they've talked about having the right um, ethnic mix, the right younger and older people. They've, they've really basically overthought it too much. My advice to you is just is, is to be as candid as you can with photography and with the pictures that you use. If you're having a picture of some of your museum guests, just go to the museum, take the photo um, of real people that go there. Don't try and overthink it and overdo it, you know, having the right number of young and old people, anything like that. You'll just get yourself into a real pickle if you just try and do that. Just be really honest and basically be human about the whole thing, I'd say. Okay. Any other questions about faces, folks? Right. I think as well, Joe, um, that's pretty much all of your presentation, isn't it? Have, you, so have I missed anything? No, nope, that's pretty much all of my presentation. Brilliant. OK. Um, so um, if anyone has got any questions, um, oh, there's um, Joe's details. Follow him on Twitter. Um, <laughs> and the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, we'll give it a minute. We've got about um, five, six, seven minutes to ask questions. So if anyone's got any questions, or if anybody wants to put anything up in the chat about um, some of the things we've talked about, so um, some of the mental models perhaps of what your visitors expect when they're using your website, or perhaps things that they expect when they're using an app or a digital interactive that you've produced, um, or as we've mentioned, perhaps some of the um, mental models that they think they apply when they enter an exhibition. Um, and that'd be great. We'll put those in the, in the notes as well and read them out so that will go on the recording. Um, if anyone's got any good examples of evoking emotions, so things like using smells or beautiful words, um, we'll always appreciate links as well. Um, or about being more human. We'll just give that a moment. Um, I think, um, do, 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 I think it's really, um, interesting what you were saying, Joe, about matching mental models and um, getting visitors to, you know, trying to think about how your visitors mm. are going to be using it. It's really interesting. Um, got a question from Kevin. Um, is it better to invest in compelling and interesting technologies, HD touchscreens, for instance, or to improve in the general quality of content? Um, the thing, I think, the thing you'll find is you could have the, the most crappy business technology and it could be the slowest thing in the world. But if you follow... The emotional stuff that I talked about here, as well as the, the mental model stuff, people will persevere a bit more. So my advice is if you if it's a choice between spending the effort in upgrading to an HD screen versus a regular screen or the option of improving the structure of the content you've got or make it more emotionally engaging, I'd say always make it always spend the effort in improving the content. Definitely. You'll get the most, um, I suppose, return on that investment in doing it that way, because people will be more forgiving of your bad technology. They'll be less forgiving of your bad content. You know, they won't, you know, they, they won't notice that as much. If the technology is not brilliant, there's a little lag between, you know, between screens of an interactive exhibit or, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's not a slower web server. People will be more forgiving if you get these basics right. I mean, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have the, you know, be as quickly, make it as quick as you can, have the best experience you can. But I, that should really be secondary to the quality of the stuff that you do. Great content will always, always engage better than a great, the great technology that surrounds it, I'd say, definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. I'm, um, I'm sure definitely from a museum point of view, we've all had things that have cost a fiver and perhaps have not used any technology and have worked very well and then spent an awful lot of money on a, a flashy touch screen that's uh, kaputted yeah. within a day or two. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's true. I mean, because I, I used to be a teacher. Um, when I was a teacher, it was... But halfway through my teaching career, a few years I was teaching, they introduced these um, these sort of interactive whiteboards, and um, you know this idea that it would make everybody a better teacher. And and actually, for me, it it detracted from the teaching experience because again, the best thing about being a teacher was the human interaction you had with the other people in your in your classroom. And the actual addition of technology in that case, and you know where the flashy touch screen and you did all these crazy things detracted from the human aspect of what was going on. So my advice is, although I work in technology, technology may not always be the answer and it may not always be the thing worth investing in. The thing worth investing in is the human stories and content and stuff behind it all, really, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think everybody um, here will already strongly agree with, with that. Um, Okay, so uh, we've still got a few more questions, a few more minutes. So if anyone's um, there, you're all still listening. So hopefully you've got some questions or things you want to share with us all. Um, I did have a question, Joe, but I've typed it somewhere now. So bear with me. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Oh, um, it was about mental models, Joe, I was going to ask. If mm -hmm. there's any kind of further information you could give us about that, anything basic or any sort of good links or anything, you know, as a, an easy way in. I do. Let me um, show you something. So somebody, a guy that I work with, I'm going to, I'll post it into the chat now. Um, a guy called Richard Caddick, he, he's put together like a little cheat sheet to help you build these. Um, um, and so I'm going to drop in a little um, cheat sheet here. So uh, I'm going to drop that into the chat now. What this would help you do is effectively, it's a great way of of, of, um, of helping you just lay them out on paper. So it's a great way of understanding um, what well, this is a good way to draw them and to understand them. And it kind of gives you some tips on the best way of kind of doing that stuff as well. And there's a presentation on there as well, which gives you a lot more detail about how to go out and do this that Richard put together. So yeah, that little link down there should help. Um, in terms right. of doing that as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to see. No, we won't really be able to read that out. Um, there will be a, a type of all the notes that will go out at some point as well. If anybody wants that link um, afterwards, if you're listening to the recording and you want that link, just drop us an email here at Kate Measures or tweet us, and I'm sure, or perhaps I'll tweet that link now as well. So mm -hmm. um, I'll get sent out. Um, Padmini um, made a good point. Personal stories in whatever technology works for visitors. Yeah, definitely. Experienced this in a recent museum I worked on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I completely agree. I mean, it'd be great to know what that was as well. Do you want to share with us a bit more? Um, but it's a good point. I think, you know, I think, right, pe people have this inbuilt ability to engage with other people, and that fits about all, all three areas of the brain. We've got it at all levels. The instinctual bit is about when people are being really horrible to us or being nice to us or faces, but all three of those areas are invoked by people telling stories. You know, we think about how great copy we have works. Great copy is because that's somebody telling somebody else a story. So anything you can do in terms of video, pictures of faces, that stuff's going to always go down well, far better than... Um, generic stock boring stuff certainly certainly true there we go as well yeah so Padmini talks about the Sea City Museum in Southampton we use a lot of oral history recordings as well as text and other ways great stuff it, I mean people's voices are great again they have a good link to the rest of the brain I mean if you can do it if you can get faces in there so talking heads is the best is a, is a great way of engaging with people people really do engage with faces but yes oral histories and text that's very very human is always going to work mm-hmm Great. I mean, I'm just having a quick, uh, just had a quick side look there at the um, at the sheet that you sent out there. It looks really interesting, actually, Joe, with the um, the goal, thinking about the things that people are trying to do. It's, it's definitely interesting, really. I mean, we often start writing exhibitions on on our sort of um, learning outcomes, what we want people to achieve. So there you go. it, it mm -hmm. just really translates the phases, you know, how how we're going to get them to achieve those things. So um, that's really great. I'll have a proper read through that later. Um, so we're coming up to the completion of our time, so we'll just give it another minute if anyone has any questions. Um, until then, uh, a massive thanks to Joe. Um, it's been really fascinating. Buy the book. Cool to... <laughs> Two seventy-five. It's an absolute bargain. I tell some great stories about jam. All right, how jam can improve your digital stuff. So if you buy the book, you get this great story about jam. It's well worth it. I oh, promise well. you. As well as chapter two, which is a huge argument between me and my mother, which is obviously very psychological, but also in the book, I talk a lot about how we, um, the different types of psychology, social psychology, cognitive psychology, all of the sort of insider tips are in there. So it's a great primer for psychology generally, as well as being, um, having some great stories about jam and an argument with my mother. Right. Well, I mean, you have me at jam. So um, <laughs> that's great. Um, last thing to say then, everybody, um, when we close this off, um, it will go through to a survey if you please please could take just a couple of minutes to complete that for us um, we do read everything that you send us back and the feedback and we use that to plan our future webinars and of course we'll pass on any any nice comments to Joe as well um, or, or, or any not so nice comments we appreciate all of them so please do take a minute to do that um, <laughs> also don't forget you can register for our final webinar which is on um, Monday and I should really have um, checked it's with Gail Bromley um, and it is on, here we go, should have been much more prepared. Um, final webinar on Monday as part of the Refresh series, 
Oh, technology fails me again. <laughs> Uh, any meeting dot com forward slash greedy squirrel. I've got I've got it here. It's um sh- it's community partnerships, definitely not speed dating. Is that the one? Thank you, Joe. Yeah, I've just brought that up. Case well. studies yeah. and developing yeah. partnerships with local communities. It sounds like a good one. Yes, brilliant. Okay then, so we'll close up now. Uh, please do take a minute to fill in the survey for us and thanks a lot, Joe. Thanks guys. Bye bye.